Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Grateful to be here with all of you today. And today we will discuss from the Srimad Bhagavatam some of the concluding sections of the teachings of Lord Kapila. And this particular section, the series of 7-8 verses that are there, they can be sometimes first of all very difficult to understand and they can be dangerous if misunderstood or misapplied. So I'll be taking this class, the whole class will be summarized through one diagram. So basically when there are difficult teachings, now difficult could be in many ways difficult but especially difficult to understand the strong statements about uh, the role and purpose and effect of women. So there are three broad ways in which the statements could be seen. One is we may absolutize those statements. This is scripture, this is what it says, and there is now nothing more to be discussed about it. This is the truth. Now somebody says, no, 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 this is, we go to the other extreme and we may relativize them. Oh, you know, people in those times believed things like this. Or maybe this is, this is just the personal opinion of some people over there at particular things. And there's so many things said like this. We don't have to take any of it seriously. You just take what you like from it. You may relativize it. And in between, if you consider these two to be the extremes of a pendulum, in between these two, is the balanced state that is we contextualize contextualize means that we try to understand the context in which it has been spoken and then we try to understand the underlying principle so let's look at these three parts the first two absolute as and relativize i will take relatively quickly and contextualize i will elaborate on that okay so Suppose we absolutize these statements. That this is said in scripture and this is absolutely true. I was traveling in the Bible Belt in America, Texas and other parts. So I saw one car with a bumper sticker on it, you know. God said it, I accept it, that settles it. So that is sometimes professed as if it is a, strong, a sign of great faith in God. God said it, so whatever is said in the Bible, that is said by God, is referring to Christianity. God said it, I accept it. Okay, and then that settles it. Okay, it might seem to be a sign of strong faith, but the problem with such an attitude, this is an example of absolutization. The problem is that, what is that it? Have I understood it correctly? Hmm. And when you say accept it, what in what spirit are you accepting it? Is it I'm accepting it to boost my ego? I mean, am I accepting it so that my actually heart grows in love? And that settles it. Okay, what issue is settled by it? Why not? Because maybe in that same book, there might be other kinds of statements. So if we consider in the same Bhagavatam, we have significantly different kinds of statements. When you absolutize it, what about contradictory statements? So, for example, the Bhagavatam says that a, a woman, more specifically a wife, is like a fortress which protects a person from the attack by the plundering senses. So now, if you consider fortress versus blind well, blind well is a transpose metaphor. It is not that the well is blind, it is rather <laughs> we can't see the well, so we are blind to the existence of the well. But these are exactly opposite metaphors, isn't it? Fortress is that which protects our life, whereas a blind well is that which endangers, may even take our life. 
So the same Bhagavatam has opposite kind of statements. So if we are going to absolutize it, why absolutize this statement only? Isn't it? Why not absolutize that statement? And if you are going to absolutize both statements, then we will go absolutely crazy. <laughs> because the two are opposite statements. Isn't it? So, now, apart from this, as I said, we could go into further logical fallacies of uh, absolutizing. But the key point is that there is there are always different kinds of statements. And even Srila Prabhupada, when he spoke, Prabhupada, the, his way of speaking was that when he was you take one position, he would firmly speak in favor of that position. But there are other times he might take the opposite position and he would speak in favor of that position. So that's why one of the principles, if you want to understand Prabhupada's teachings, is that we have to look at everything that he has said on that position, on that particular issue. So when you absolutize, we have contradictory statements and then we end up what Srila Prabhupada warned us against doing. What Srila Prabhupada said that often Bhagavita commentators who are unscrupulous do. That is, we end up with half hen logic. The Ardha Kukut Nyay. That is, somebody likes just the part of the hen which uh, gives eggs, but they don't like the part of the hen which you have to feed. So, when we are basically, when we are selective, we often are deceptive. So, selective study can be deceptive study. Selective quoting can be deceptive quoting. So, somebody might take this kind of statement from, we'll talk about context a little bit more, but somebody might take it from a very male chauvinistic perspective and justify it to dominate and persecute and exploit women. So, so the point is, scripture has to be studied holistically. Now, we may be attracted to particular sections in scripture and we can focus on that as a part of our growth. But, when we use half and logic, mm -hmm. then the consequence of that is, we get a distorted understanding. Mm -hmm. Now, we could, the third problem is that, when we take one statement and absolutize it, that can lead to fanaticism. So, fanaticism, now, just the world is reeling with shock at the fanatical display of the Hamas extremists who just uh, destroy so many people in Israel. And this is just the latest. Now, we might want to simplistically associate fanaticism with a particular group or a particular religion. But the underlying idea of fanaticism, the mentality that may lead to fanatical displays to various degrees of violence, that fanaticism, the underlying principle, is actually very familiar. In fact, you can say it is disturbingly familiar. So, what is the familiar uh, principle of fanaticism? What works for me hmm? is the only thing that can work for anyone. What works for me is the only thing that can work for anyone. If I am worshipping God in this way, this is the only way God can be worshipped. And if anybody else is worshipping God in another way, that's wrong. If this statement benefits me, now it could be possible that this statement, we'll talk about contextualizing more again, but it is possible that this kind of statement can inspire caution and uh, care in gender interactions and there are many people who, in fact everyone can be benefited from it, but there are many people who might be especially benefited by it. And if they start getting benefited by that, they may think, oh this, this, is, this is true, okay, but they may absolutize it. And then that can lead to fanaticism. So that's why there's a difference between fanaticism versus becoming fanatical about something versus taking inspiration or instruction from something. 
Okay, taking inspirational instruction means, yeah, this helps me, so let me use it. Fanaticism means, I use that scriptural, st scriptural statement like a mace to smash everyone who disobeys, disagrees with me on the head. You know, so when, in, when sh Shastra becomes Shastra, that is what can lead to fanaticism. When we start using scripture as a weapon, when scripture is weaponized, then it leads to very easily fanaticism. Especially weapon to beat others down. So, this is the problem with absolutizing statements like this. That's the first part of the talk. What is the second part in the pendulum? Relative wise. Well, I don't want to, you to realize that you have to relativize. <laughs> that is not the point. <laughs> you have to contextualize, not relativize. So now relative wise. Now relativization can be done in various ways. As I said, oh, people in those times thought like that. Oh, that is just their opinion. Oh, there's so, so many people, there's so many statements like that. So, we just, nowadays is the idea of overall relativism. Even moral relativism is there. So this is right for you, that is right for me. Like that, we can start relativizing. Now, relativize, this also has multiple problems. The first problem with relativizing is can everything be relativized? Now, people may say, oh, morality is personal. What you do in your private life and your professional life are separate. What you do in your private life is your business. Well, to some extent, the principle may be valid. But the point is, can we just relativize morality? I was uh, in America giving a talk in Microsoft. And after one of the talks, such a per one person asked this question. So I told him that, is there anyone in the world right now who is doing something that is wrong? He said, yeah, of course. There are rapists, there are child abusers, there are terrorists. Uh, they are horrible people. I said, okay. Do you do you think that they think they are doing wrong? No. If you see the terrorists, they were celebrating what they were doing. They actually very gleefully click photos and videos of what they were doing and broadcast it as a sign of it. Now what most people would consider as child abuse, many people consider as pedophilia. And they say that, oh, this is just the way we, ex we express our love for children. It's horrible, but many most people when they do wrong, they come up with their own justification for wrong. So the point is, you cannot relativize everything in the world. It just doesn't work that way. So I was speaking in Amazon after that, one of the attendants, he was like one of the managers over there, that top man leaders in that plant. So he said that, you now we are into selling, that's our business. But, and when we, one section in Amazon is apparel, selling clothes, but, Say when we we have to advertise clothes, we show people wearing those clothes. Sometimes people they're revealing poses. But say when we are selling children's clothes, we don't show children wearing those clothes. I don't know if that's a policy now, but till sometime it was. Maybe it is now. The point is we don't want in any way to encourage child sexual abuse. So even a commercial company has boundaries. Everything cannot be relativized. So this, is, so this is a general statement against relativization. Now, if we take it forward, so the answer is a categorical no. Even from a pure secular perspective. The Nuremberg trials were a big landmark in this, in world history. Because the overall ethos was going towards relativization of everything. But the Nuremberg trials basically were, they happened after the Second World War, when the Nazi generals were tried, Nazi generals, the soldiers were tried. And they said, they did some of the most barbaric things in human history. 
See, humans have been brutal throughout history. But the Holocaust was the first time in human history that, that industrial efficiency was brought to mass murder. There have always been people who have been killing each other. And there have been brutal people. Jangiz Khan is supposed to have killed thousands and thousands of people. There are people like that. But this was the first time industrial efficiency was brought. They just used gas chambers to just destroy people. So when they were tried, they just gave a standard reply. They said, we were following orders. And the principle in the military is to follow orders. So they said, we didn't do anything wrong because we were following orders. So then they said that, so the, when the trials were held, the point came up that, that, the, that following orders is a principle. But you cannot use that to neglect or reject basic humanity. Now, innocent civilians are just being killed. So the point is, oh, we followed orders and so this was right for us. And you may think it is wrong, but it is right. No. Independent of what you think, there are certain things which are right and wrong. So, if we relativize, start relativizing things, then we, nobody can function like that in real life. Because there have to be some absolutes. Now, what exactly those absolutes are, which things fall in absolute, which, which things don't fall in absolute, that's a question. That's a question which can be separately discussed. But the idea to say that there are no absolutes. It's like saying that, this, that, that being the second point, it relativizing it doesn't reflect reality. Now you may say reality is not an absolute. So for example, some people may have this, this is black and this is white. So now black and white are distinct colors. Now somebody may try to go and reduce everything to only black and white. This is black and this is white. Well, reality is not that simple. Because everything cannot be put as black and white. There are in between many shades of grey. So when we absolutize, we say everything is black and white. But when we relativize, what we are essentially saying is, everything is simply grey. That there is no such thing as black and white. That is not reality. There are things which are black and white. And the problem is, to reduce every, just as reducing everything to black and white is a problem, reducing everything to grey is also a problem. Isn't it? So when we relativize, it doesn't reflect reality. And the more and, and one of the most practical problems with relativizing is what is called as the slippery slope fallacy. Slippery slope. That means if you if we are say on a mountain or something like that or on a hill, and the slope is there. Normally we would go down slowly, we will go down. But this whole floor is covered with a slippery layer. Then what happens is you take one step and it goes out of control and you roll down. So, similarly, when we start relativizing one thing, hey, you know, this is relative. And tomorrow we may relativize something else. Day after tomorrow we may relativize something else. And then where does the relativization stop? Isn't it? We may relativize everything in, in scripture, everything in tradition. And then there will be no tradition itself left. Because everything becomes related. So, now, this is a, a, this is a, like a common reading of that saying, Yatomat Tatopat. Now, when it was originally spoken, it was spoken in a different sense. Yatomat Tatopat means, originally, when those particular spiritual years talked about it, as is your opinion, so is your path. As is your understanding, so is your path. Yatomat, hmm? hmm. So, But the, the way it has become translated into common understanding, 
independent of what its uh, teachers originally thought is that oh you just do whatever you want and that is right for you it's not that simple it's not that simple because there are definitely activities which which do good for us and there are activities which are harmful for us so for example somebody says that you know i drink and i feel close to god by drinking well okay maybe you may feel close to god whether you are feeling you may feel close to some higher reality but something different you feel close to like people used to take this lsd and feel we are going in a trance and we are seeing god well whether you are seeing god or whether you are seeing a devil or whether you are seeing uh, some 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 something from your own imagination the point is the net result it doesn't take you closer to god the net result is one becomes hooked to that substance and one goes further down so so without going into the specifics the point is this is slippery slope once we relativize one thing tomorrow we relativize the second third fourth fifth now that way the whole scripture just becomes relative so many religions across the world have suffered from relativization so for example now the statements like these Uh, what we are reading right now we are trying to make sense of they are there in every religious tradition so in the christian tradition i am not generalizing christianity definitely not absolutizing the statement of christianity but in some versions of christian tradition which are very aggressively feminist so they said that you know the whole bible there is a kernel of truth to it but it has come down through patriarchy so it is all all contaminated by masculine agenda so they said that we will remove everything masculine from the bible so god is referred to by the he pronoun so they replaced god by he by they and on top of that they said why should jesus be a man so they have churches where jesus is depicted with female bodily parts now this is you know you're just going you are butchering history by this so relativization can lead to any extremes in india there are as per the last survey there are about something like 20 temples of amitabh bachchan and maybe 17 tem- maybe 15 temples of uh, several other bollywood stars and people actually do aarti and puja of those temples there are female stars also oh you know god can come in many forms so this is my god why we have to say my god <laughs> <laughs> so this doesn't work relativizing is a dangerous slippery slope if we start going that and now that slip so now that brings us to the in between of the pendulum what was the in between contextualize contextualize so contextualize means that we understand that there is every every statement is made in a particular context mm-hmm. and underlying that statement is a purpose or a principle and we try to understand what is the principle so we could say the way to understand this is sometimes this term is used this is a ladder of abstraction see abstract means that which is not specific not concrete so generally anything universal is abstract so at the bottom of this ladder are specific things specific details so this is where the context comes in hmm at the top of this ladder are universal principles so generally whenever we have to learn something so there are specific details and there are universal principles so specific details means okay what is spoken what is the statement so let, let's first understand the ladder of abstraction relatively simply say so people go and watch movies or read novels at one level it's for entertainment 
just want to be entertained. Oh, this character did this, and this story this happened, and that happened. But beyond that, people also, especially movies or novels that are not just uh, simply about uh, uh, run-of-the-mill kind of uh, stories for sex or violence or whatever, if there are some deeper messages over there, then when people learn those messages, oh, this person, you know, this person was so short-tempered, and this happened, and that happened. And then, oh, you know, this is the danger of getting short-tempered. So, example, the Ramayana. The Ramayana is very, very specific in terms of the characters over there. Very beautiful, very inspiring characters in many ways. So, we would, at the specific level, we understand the character of Ramayana. So, uh, say for example, Ravan. So, who is Ravan? So, at the level of specific details, we would ask the question, who is Ravan? And that's important to understand. But at the level of universal principle, we understand what is Ravan. So, Ravan is both a person and Ravan is also a principle. Ravan is, it represents lust. And the specific details of Ravan's story may or may not be so important for everyone. But that principle is important for everyone. So, Applying this, this, uh, this concept of the ladder of abstraction, the Prabhupada does it all the time in his purpose. Prabhupada may not use the word ladder of abstraction, but Prabhupada does it constantly when he is explaining. So, for example, Arjuna is in tears. Prabhupada is taking that particular, in, he talks about that in 2.1 in the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna is tam tatha krupaya vishtam ashrupurna kulekshan. When he's speaking that, Prabhupada says that, that such tears are a sign of ignorance and attachment and bodily conception. And then the whole world is suffering from the skin disease. So Prabhupada is not just thinking about Arjuna's tears, he's, he's going to the top of the ladder and he's universalizing it. What is the universal principle? The principle is of attachment. So whenever we want to understand scripture, especially difficult statements, so there are So, at the bottom of the ladder of abstraction, we have, we have the literal statement. This is at the bottom, bottom of the ladder of abstraction. And then, from there we go to the top, there is the universal principle. Or, you could say overall purpose. The purpose of the Bhagavatam, if we consider, is it, we'll talk, we'll apply this shortly, but this is a, we go from the specific statement to the universal principle. And then, after that, we come down the ladder of abstraction. So here we go up, and then we come down. Come down means we look at today's context. What does it mean now? So we go from there to the universal principle. From the universal principle, we come down to the contemporary context. So what does this statement what does this statement mean originally? What is the principle behind the statement? How does that principle apply now? Prabhupada does this dance up and down the ladder of abstraction very spontaneously, effortlessly, seamlessly in his purports. Say, for example, if you consider the 15.6 translation, Parastasmat, no, it is, Natad bhasayato suryo na shanko na pavaka yad gattvana nivartante tad dhama paramamama. Now, in the translation, there are three items which are listed. There is, or in the Sanskrit verse, there is sun, moon and fire. That's the, that's, the sun, that's the verse. Now, in the translation, Prabhupada is giving sun, moon, fire and electricity. Now, there is no mention of electricity in the verse. Vidyuta, nothing like that is there. Now, how is Prabhupada adding that? What is Prabhupada doing? Prabhupada is actually... okay. He is, yeah, he is going up and down the ladder of abstraction very effortlessly. 
So what is the, the in that abode there is no sun, moon or fire. Now what does that mean? There is, it basically means there is no dependence on external light sources. It is self-luminous. And this will be contrasted later when Krishna talks about the material world. Krishna uses the same three elements. In this is this is 15.6. If you go to 15.12, Krishna says that Yad Aditya Gatam Tejo Jagat Bhase Teklam. Yad Chandramasi Achagno Tat Tejo Vindhimamakam. Same three elements. So in the material world, there is dependence on fire. Dependence on some source of light, like heat, sun, moon or fire. So Prabhupada takes that principle that there is no dependence on external light sources. And then he climbs down, the, climbs down this ladder and he says, now today when we talk about dependence on light sources, for most people, the prominent light source in their mind is electricity. Because most people nowadays live indoors, unlike in the past. So most of our life is indoors and we need light sources. So Prabhupada is not in one sense distorting the words. He is making the words more understandable for us in today's words. So this is contextualizing. You go up the ladder and down the ladder. So now how do we contextualize these statements? This is the last part of the last part of the class. The third part contextualizing. I talked about till now the principle of contextualizing. Now, how do we contextualize over here? So, I'll talk about it in three broad parts. Contextualizing in terms of text, teaching and times. Now, in terms of the text, the Srimad Bhagavatam is spoken to a particular person at a particular time. It is spoken to Parikshit Maharaj who is about to die. And at that time, everything other than Krishna is a distraction. So, what even we in our ordinary life, even if people are not very spiritual, at that time, if somebody is about to die, nowadays palliative care for near-death patients is near-death people is becoming a big field. So the concerns at the time of death are significantly different from the concerns throughout one's life. So this is spoken to a person about to die. Now it does not mean that the end, everything in the Bhagavatam is only for the person who is about to die. But certainly the emphasis is there. So the text is, it is, you could say, meditation at death. What should one be remembering and doing at the time of death? So now, how exactly will that apply to all of us? That depends. Parikshit Maharaj had renounced the world and accepted that he was going to die in seven days. Does that mean that's what we all have to do? Well, we may die in seven days, we may die in seven moments. But we may not die for seven years, we may not die for 70 years. So we have to prepare for various possibilities. And then we have to see how best can I serve in this situation. So much of the, much of the Bhagavatam's emphatic statements, not all the statements, the emphatic statements, are directed towards the specific context of the Bhagavatam. That is, this is meant for a person who is about to die. And at that time, yes, uh, thoughts of uh, not as only women, what is because even women or children or wealth or anything can be a significant distraction. Now, that's one thing. So we need to nuance those teachings. Now, Prabhupada himself, for example, says that in one lecture, the purpose of marriage is to be happy. Sarvam Sukhi Santunu, Sarva, Sarve Santu Nirama. And Prabhupada quotes that verse and he says that Grahastashram, Prabhupada, for example, says the purpose of marriage is to make the mind peaceful so that we can focus on Krishna. We all have, we all have certain physical needs, certain emotional needs. And if those needs are not fulfilled, the mind can be extremely agitated. 
Now that does not mean that we make fulfilling those needs the purpose of our life. But to some extent, those needs are fulfilled and we can, we can move forward in looking for other things in life, in pursuing other things in life. So, what one requires for the long journey of life may not exactly be the same as one needs at the time of death. Now, again, this is not relativizing the Bhagavatam. The Bhagavatam gives principles of bhakti that apply throughout life. But specific emphasis may be at the time of death. That's one point. Now, if we look at the broader teaching of the Bhagavatam, the broader teaching or of the Bhagavatam itself or of the broad Vedic literature. Prabhupada says, let's say, Ikshet Atmano Mrityum, that's the Sanskrit verse, that a woman blocks the path to self realization or spiritual realization. Atmano Mrityur, it's like the death of the soul. Okay, let's, let's accept that statement. We will evaluate that statement slightly or try to understand the statement a uh, little later. But even if we accept the statement at face value right now. See, the fact is that most of the world is not interested in self-realization. And manushyanam sahasreshu kashid yadati siddhaye. Because so among thousands of people, a few even endeavor to know about higher reality. And among those who endeavor to know about higher reality, a few come to know about me. So if we consider the teaching of scripture, is it only for spiritualists? Only for those seeking self-realization? What about rest of humanity? Is the teaching meant for all of humanity? So now that is why, if we consider in the tradition itself, if you look at the broad teaching of the tradition, Vivaha is considered to be a samskara and it is considered auspicious. It is, it is celebrated. Now, if something would be bringing two people together and that is going to be the cause of death, then why would you celebrate that? Isn't it? Now, now, now there is this, uh, at least in India, there is this called the big fat Indian wedding where people spend, a, it's like a competition to display one's wealth and everything. But even if you put that aside, the fact is, if we look in scripture, we look at uh, the weddings are celebrated in general and the samskaras that are there associated with it, all the elaborate ceremony. It's not that they came by chance, they are part of the tradition. So, the broad teaching is for all of humanity and we can't expect everyone to be immediately focused only on self-realization. So, yes, at women or more specifically attachment. I'll talk about teaching a little bit more further. But we look at the teaching, the purpose is different for different people. So for many people, if, if you look at the purpose is twofold. There is moksha and there is dharma. Now moksha is generally world denying, world rejecting. The goal of moksha. This is talked about in the Upanishads, primarily. But Dharma is much more world affirming. And this is talked about in the Vedas. By Vedas, I mean the Vedic Samhitas. Mm -hmm. So there, for example, there is a lot of emphasis given. So for example, the Manusmuti it is said, that place where women are respected, the gods shower their blessings. And where women are not respected, there will be never any blessings of the gods. There are many statements like that. A woman, for example, in the Dharmic scriptures, is considered to be Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. That's very different from the idea of the embody of the a dark well or a, a blind well or embodiment of death. So, in the same tradition, we have Saraswati. She is not just the no, so she's a goddess of wealth, she's a goddess of learning. And so, so we have to see that the broad teaching is meant for different people at different levels. And for many people, on their normal growth journey, you know, a responsible, righteous relationship can be a 
a step forward, not a step backward. So the idea is, people, everybody to some extent tends to be self-centered. But when somebody enters into a dharma vivaha, they get married. Then what is happening over there is that they are entering into a responsible, righteous relationship. <coughs> righteous means it is within the bondage of dharma. When they are entering into that, that actually helps people grow. You, it helps people to think of something beyond oneself. Right? Maybe just one's own life partner. After that, there will be children. But it gets a person to think of something beyond themselves. And that is a path of growth. Now, of course, beyond that, so it's like expansion of consciousness. I think of me only first. Then I think about my family. Then, as it may go further, may think about my country or my community or whatever. And eventually, we'll think about my, my Lord. And then, that is where our, we attain Bhakti. So, in one sense, this is a progressive journey upwards. You could put it like this. This, this is a progression upwards. So, in the expansion of consciousness, a family and having a family and having a relationship, that could be a step up for people. Now, if somebody is here, it's a step up for them. So if, say, somebody is already here, then it might be a step down. Somebody is already evolved to a high level of selflessness, it might be a step down for them. But for most of humanity, it is a step up. So this is, in the context, not, ev not everybody is about to die right now. Not everybody is singularly focused on self-realization. So for most of humanity, we have to see how dharma, in the sense of, dharma is order in the world, order, virtuous order in the world. Dharma is virtuous order. Like in today's world, we may use the word law and order. So dharma is virtuous order. How this can be maintained in the world is also important. And a summary rejection of all relationships, including, including the vivaha samskar, can be actually very damaging for society. Uh, having said that, now another point, we are talking about contextualizing. So I talked about three things. In terms of broad teaching, the teaching is for all of humanity. It is not just for people who are self-realized, not just for people who are about to die. And that brings us to the last part is timing or times. Now in today's world, how are things functioning? So in today's world, if we consider what, so what is this, so the point I was making is all this is not to be absolutized, but at the same time it is not to be relativized. So basically, for gender interactions, there have to be boundaries. Without boundaries, we cannot function. And even in today's world, that is considered important. Uh, we may have an ultra-liberal society, but then still, if you consider most places, airports or public places, you will have separate restrooms for men and women. Now there is this whole phenomenon of trans people. There are men who change their gender and become women. Now if they enter into women's bathrooms, many women feel uncomfortable. Those women may be very liberal women. But this, this person has the physique and more or less of a man. And they feel uncomfortable. That's a big civic debate right now. Whether trans, trans, trans women, trans men, whatever you want to call them. Whether they should be allowed in women's bathrooms or not. That's just one example. Even in ultra-liberal society, certain areas, there is gender separation. Today we may say that today is a very sexually liberal, licentious age. But still, there is the basic boundary of consent, without which you cannot function. And if that boundary is violated, then there are, con there are consequences. Now, is consent, uh, the, is, is consent all that is required? Well, certainly not. People all the time consent to do things which are harmful for them. People smoke, people drink, people do drugs. So, consent cannot be the sole criteria. 
But my point is that the principle of boundaries is something which is universal. And even in the liberal age, liberal times of today, the boundaries are important. Now, exactly what would be the boundaries in today's world? That is something we have to be careful about. We have to, we cannot rigidly impose scriptural boundaries in today's interactions. It just won't work. So, for, for example, Prabhupada says that uh, uh, that women and men would have separate residential quarters. Now, maybe in the past when most people were in rural settings where people had big houses, that might have been possible. And even that, if you look at the historical reality, this was only possible for well-to-do Kshatriyas, Brahmanas, Vaishyas. If, but for people who were not wealthy, as far as the Bhagavatam's commentators describe, Sudama and his wife and his child were living in one small hut. There were no separate residential quarters there. So that's not necessarily practical for everyone. So, but the principle, so the specific gender boundaries may not be applicable in today's world. But the principle that there have to be boundaries is universal. And then how those boundaries are to be applied, that is something will depend on Desha Kala Patra. So when we consider Desha Kala Patra, Dharmagya, it is described about Bhishma Pitama, it is described about Narad Muni in the Bhagavatam. Twice that reference comes, that according to time, place, circumstance. So when we say time, place, circumstance, we are not relativizing. We are not saying this is not true. There is a kernel of truth that is definitely there. The principle is universal. But the exact principle, how to apply it, that has to be decided according to time, place, circumstance. I'll conclude with two examples of how not to apply it. How to apply it is an elaborate subject and that has to be as a discussed. Ultimately, it will be different in every, in every mainstream society and its culture, every particular uh, uh, yatra and its mood, and every individual ultimately. So, the specific boundaries Now, they will be dependent on mainstream society. They will be dependent on the, the groups or the community's ethos within that eth. The community's mood within that ethos. Some communities will be more conservative, some communities will be more liberal. And that will depend on the individual. So, this is basically Desha Kala Patra. But beyond that, how it is not to be applied? This is not, as I said, scripture is not to be weaponized. The idea of boundaries. So I met several Prabhupada disciples, Matajis, and I talked with them. See, in the early stages, devotees were also very young and often they became fanatical because they rejected mainstream society and living a very different way. So when the first time that, that many devotees, they would read that verse, that what is that? Yadaudhi Bhattanari Sangame Smarimani. That when Yamunachari is saying that when I think of sexual indulgence with a woman, my lips curl in distaste, distaste and I spit at the thought. So now, this was taken and was misapplied where there were several devotees who would spit at women. When, when Prabhupada came to know about it, he was enraged. Oh, this is unconscionable. This is not, you don't spit at anyone at all. First of all, you shouldn't spit only, but at all you spit. It is, this is not what the scripture is saying. Yamunachari is saying, not saying I spit at women. He says, I spit at the thought. And even how do you spit a thought? It's a non literal statement. He said, You can't spit at a thought. Spit is physical. But applying it that way is horrible. So this is, you take, if you absolutize it, you take, literally take everything and apply it. And that, that can lead to what would be serious Vaishnava Prath. Women are also devotees. And even if they are not devotees, there is also Bhakti Thakur Dakar talks about Jiva Prath. That every living being, even if that person is not a devotee right now, that person is a part of Krishna. And therefore, they need to be respected. So that, that doesn't work. Another was, I answer many questions on my website, especially scientists. So I was asked one question by one Mataji. She said that, 
you know, my sister and I, we grew up, we grew up in a, we grew up in a, from our childhood we were very religious. And we had decided when we get married, we will get married only to a, uh, to a religious man. So, says my, uh, in her workplace, my sister met a Christian man who was very devout and she married him. And he said, during, um, uh, at my workplace, I met a Hare Krishna devotee. And I saw that he was very religious, so I married him. He says, now, two years after both of us are married, he says, the, the contrast between us is terrible. He says, my, my sister's husband's religion, she is not converted, but he says, my sister's other Christianity teaches that a good wife is a blessing from God. But he says, my husband's religion teaches him that I am a distraction from God, that I have deviated him from God. He says, is this how I am meant to feel throughout my life? Is this the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita? Is this the teaching of the Vedic tradition? So I answered elaborately and I connected that, that, devote, that couple with a devotee counselor, marital counselor. But the point I said is that every ashram has its particular focus. And if somebody is in the Brahmachari ashram, Sanyas ashram, the way a person functions is different. A person in the Grahastha ashram, a responsibility is protecting women. And protecting women is also emotionally protecting. It is not violating or burdening or insulting or disrespecting. So, is a woman a temptation? Yes, yes. But the same Bhagavatam, the next verse will say, that is a man is a temptation for women. See, the Bhagavatam is not targeting a particular demographic. That's what happens when we misapply. The Bhagavatam may have negative statements about women, but the next verse says, a woman should see a man like Maya. Then the Bhagavatam is also filled with what might be considered uncharitable statements, even of Brahmanas. Isn't it so many Brahmanas are portrayed in negative light? Durvasa is short-tempered and he tries to curse. And the Bhagavatam itself begins with Shringi being short-tempered. Isn't it? So the Bhagavatam does not target one particular demographic. It highlights the spiritual deficiencies of humanity at large. And every demographic is, is deficient in some way. It can be an obstacle in some ways. The Bhagavatam also says that Shukracharya is a Brahmana, but that Brahmana is obstructing Bali Maharaj from surrendering to Vamandev, to Vishnu. So, if we use scripture to weaponize and demonize particular demographics, that is disastrous. So, the two things, misapplying these kind of statements, which I said I'll conclude with this is, it's, we should not disrespect, nor should we demonize. Demonize means, so for, for if, if within a devotee, within a dharmic vivaha, even if one partner might not be a devotee or whatever, the point is, this is a partnership. And it's a relationship by which both can go closer toward Krishna. So, rather than seeing this as a temptation or a distraction, we see it as a relationship, as a partnership, it can help us go closer to Krishna. So, misapplication can lead to great, not just, uh, not just Vaishnava Parad towards devotees, but it can also alienate half of humanity from Bhakti. And that is certainly something which neither the Bhagavatam wants, nor Srila Prabhupada wants. So, sometimes we may take the statements of the Bhagavatam and end up defeating the purpose of the Bhagavatam. We may take the statements of Prabhupada and we may misapply them to defeat the purpose of Srila Prabhupada. Instead of inspiring people towards becoming Krishna conscious, we may end up alienating people from Krishna consciousness. And that is to be avoided. That's why we have to keep first things first. The first things first is, it is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. It is not the International Society for, for absolutizing this statement or that statement or something like that. So when we keep in this situation, what is the best way I can be Krishna Conscious and I can help others to be Krishna Conscious. Then, that is cultivating and inspiring. Cultivating Krishna Conscious ourselves and inspiring Krishna Consciousness in others.
If we keep this statement in mind, then we won't misuse or misapply such statements or even misunderstand them ourselves. So I'll summarize what I discussed today. I talked about broadly how to understand some such statements. I talked about first, the, broadly the pendulum. Within that, we discussed how we should not mm, absolutize the statements. Absolutizing will lead us to what about the contradictory statements. Then we end a half hand, half hand logic and we end up with fanaticism. So then we might go down to the point of relativizing. But when we relativize, what happens is that it, we are essentially what we are doing is we are making, we are absolutizing relativism. It just doesn't work. It's, I talk about Nuremberg trials, that there is, we cannot absolutize relativism. It's a, when we start doing that, it, it doesn't, it, it disagrees with reality. Real life has black and white and also has grey. But to say it's only grey, that doesn't work. And lastly, we discuss it's a slippery slope. Where will we start once we start relativizing? So then, in the balanced state is to contextualize. And how do we contextualize? I talked about here the ladder of abstraction. We go up and down the ladder of abstraction. Where we start with specifics. And then we go to universals. And then we come down to specifics. So when we are doing this, we look at the text. What is the purpose of the text? And then we try to understand what in the original context what, the, what does this mean. Then we talk about so text is primarily focusing at at death. It's not teaching only about death, but that's not necessarily focused for everyone. Teaching the teaching is not just for people who are interested in self-realization. Teaching is for all of humanity, not just spiritual seekers. And for all of humanity, what will raise them up may be different. Then, uh, for what is applying for all of humanity and, and times. So, in today's world, how boundaries, so boundaries are important, but boundaries to be decided according to time, place and circumstance. So, but, uh, and then how not to apply the boundaries. That's one, that a couple of examples were discussed. And the conclusion was that to contextualize, we need to learn to keep First things first. We are not here to insist that women are like this or men are like this or brahmanas are like this. We are here to try to all become Krishna conscious. And that's why we see in our particular context how best can we become Krishna conscious and we can how can we inspire Krishna consciousness in others. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.